coming here to talk about and that was what we discussed previously that uh, it would be interesting to give some highlights on some experiences such as this one the one of tactical urbanism um, and um, in a way or as a an opportunity to just not look at each experience or each action of tactical <laughs> urbanism but to look as this as a potential to reflect about cities to reflect about uh, about plans and to reflect about planning theory under a complexity perspective for that reason i added to my title discussing the adaptive pr properties of cities plans and citizens movements within this example of tactical urbanism experiences um, came very much from an architectural background but I've been moving to public policy so this is a, a combination of both uh, uh, both fields and also uh, of experience in terms of planning and the the, the, the reflection about all these um, all these processes between public institutions and, and citizens that's what really uh, I found interesting and what I'm being dis researching in terms of the informal processes such as this one or others like informal settlements um, yeah this came from a, a, it came an opportunity to contact Mike Leiden and say why don't we do a translation of tactical urbanism into Portuguese so me and some other colleagues we did it especially because it's very useful to the Portuguese speaking public in Portugal but in, there's lots of initiatives in Brazil and Latin America in general so we thought this was so it's released it's available and this was uh, our first uh, this was uh, th that, that came a few years ago and later on starting to work on it just published this paper on environment and planning B about really how can tactical urbanism initiatives promote or contribute to the evolutionary path of cities uh, so the topics will be very much about the adaptive properties of uh, of cities uh, and in this case formal and informal play an important role uh, the place or the, the space that formal planning processes take on this uh, on the path of the city and how uh, planning institutions can show adaptive properties and finally uh, looking at, at at the tactical initiatives the adaptive properties that can be included in this in this um, in, in some of example uh, some examples so this is really the, the the aim and i'm going to skip this slide to say that well if we read and we're talking about Stephen marshall this morning i added here some uh, qualities we can say that cities are in inevitably evolving so whether we want or not they evolve and because they are they are complex and there are multiple interactions that uh, contribute to that evolution plans desperately try to be responsive towards that non-linear path that cities have and citizens apparently play a bigger role on decision making. I put I include here the apparently, because this has been also something very interesting on this discussion between planning institutions and citizens. All this empowerment about participatory budgeting. I've been looking at this in the case of Lisbon also. Sometimes give me the feeling that the I'm talking about the case I know, Lisbon that the fact that you distribute power by doing actions like this are a way of concentrating power because you give people the idea that they are participating but at the end you are concentrating the decision making inside the institution so that's why I keep putting here the apparently as something that yes it might be happening uh, we have to I think we have to evaluate more on the mid long term the real effects of this kind of participation on decision making so uh, the, the, the starting point for this uh, talk is about putting together 
the most the main ev evidences on on cities change the pressure that the pressures that are put in plans today and the energy because that's a fact energy is putting it's put here on us it's putting on communities that if are involved on in these processes energy are put in the citizens in general in when they participate in budgeting when they participate in place making etc how can we make this bigger how can we take advantage of these and use these um, use this energy in favor of or including it in planning so in starting by looking to planning institutions uh, this, some brief definitions I'm not just talking about the organisms but also about the rules so we have here a dynamic that is caused by the interpretation of the rules through, uh, through time and uh, they tend on one hand to be rigid but on the other hand we aim for them to be also flexible and to cater to the individual or the more specific interests um, why tactical urbanism it's becoming very popular it is uh, considered almost an almost movement these days and it's part of a broader spectrum of initiatives in which do-it-yourself urbanism is part of it uh, and it's strongly linked to placemaking of course because well, as we will see many of these uh, properties that are associated are very much linked with place making and looking beyond tactical urbanism means to put some questions about what does really mean this bottom-up actions what does it mean really bottom-up times I, I how can tactical ur urbanism participate in the city change and in the city planning not be something apart and there are options I'm just opening in this slide options and I'm, I'm going obviously to to, to then to at, at the end to 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 develop one of these but of course starting with there are some in some cases planning institutions simply ignore these activities they let them occur they ignore the existing they don't they don't uh, sanction them they don't unsanction them there's no reaction to that they can give them a special place within the the management of the city to say okay we have our general planning framework and then we have this more concentrated um, uh, structure to deal with this kind of uh, of, um, of of initiatives or we try to integrate them and make them part of the planning process there's a a long story a long history of a, a tactical urbanism initiatives they start really i mean they it's claimed to to be start the first tactical initiative in 1914 and from then on but what we really see is that on the last two decades the increase of of uh, of initiatives and also not just in the time but also in in, in different spaces are increasing uh, pre pretty much and um moving from this initial um, um, introduction to, to tactical urbanism to complexity there are a few things that we know and there are few still about planning and complexity we know for instance that some of the uh, processes that we've been talking during this day like self-organization like uh, evolution like co-evolution they require conditions and those conditions can be pressure can be motivation to do something can be the effect of um, cascading events that start with one simple one and from then on it creates a cascade a, a cascade and a, a path dependency it can be trigger events which was something uh, that was mentioned here and when we talk in particular about evolution uh, Winder uh, refers three main conditions or qualities for evolution to occur ontology which means to have a continuous existence of a certain uh, setting of a certain network diversity in terms of having different needs and different uh, characteristics among the the, 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 the the actors and stress pressures that make things move on and make things change well 
the, the interesting thing is that many of the tactical uh, uh, urbanism uh, initiatives are the result of these on one hand, but on the other hand, as planning institutions are, are working today, they are putting this tactical urbanism aside and they are trying to create in an artificial way the same pressure, the same continuity in time, and the same di diversity. When we say we have to create through a plan the mixed use, we are trying to impose something, but then maybe beside there is unsanctioned experiences already from tactical urbanism, which include mixed use. So there's a mismatch here between the energy that people and citizens might put on their uh, initiatives and the, the, uh, what's happening in, in terms of planning institutions and in planning processes. What we don't know, and this is not so good for us, is how this works. In, at, at the, this is still very new to look at these processes through the complexity way. How does this work in different contexts? We, we can find and we found here in this room and in other contexts successful cases or examples that we can name as where uh, complexity or these these processes related to complexity had uh, an import played an important role, but we don't know how do they how they are not we cannot replicate them first of all because we are talking about unique social processes. We don't know how will they evolve. We know how, how, how they came until now. And we know that, well, at least some cases that I've been researching, they depend on very extreme situations. Well, very extreme situations that can cause this pressure, for instance, don't occur on a daily basis. They are really very exceptional. So can we bring these to the, our daily routine and to uh, look for um, uh, opportunities to... to to extract lessons that can be applied on a daily basis to, to our work as planners. Well, go, going back to uh, going back to adaptive properties of cities and going back to, to Marshall when he talks about the three paradigms of the city uh, of the city path, uh, and he, he really says that well, the city has such a scale he cannot, that cannot be compared with a, with an object because exactly city is complex is the is, um, is, is, is the result of such an amount of interactions that it, it, it becomes too complex. Well, and what he says is basically what we've been doing is trying to look at cities not as complex, but, well, we did that until the 19th century. We looked at cities as simple objects that could be used. We knew how, to f how they function and we knew how to use it. We knew it even how to fix it and how to adapt it to the long term. Um, there are an in-between level, and, and this is what he says, well, really, what is simple is our house. We know how the house is confined, what are the interactions there, how does it work, etc. It's not just a matter of size, because, for instance, if we have a touristy resort, it can be the size of a city, but still we have a a simple program, we know it takes, who is in charge of this space, we takes responsibility, etc. So it might be complicated to manage everything, but it's not yet complex. And it's really the city where we find all this richness of interactions, etc. And this brings us to the capacity, it's this complexity that makes the city able to adapt. This is a s very small example. This is a, the main train station of Colombo in Sri Lanka from the colonial times when S Colombo had a few thousand inhabitants. Now it has several million and uh, it's still the same train station. They don't let the, the, the pedestrians to cross in front of the train station because the amount of tuk-tuks and traffic is so much that it's impossible to try to, to cross. So there are already barriers here that so you have this front, etc., but nothing works anymore like it was supposed to. But still, this place and this part of the city continues to adapt. But there are limits to adapt to adaptation. There, there's a, a limit in which cities move from a place to the other, and we know this through the history of our cities. There's adaptation until a certain moment, and from then on, it can move to another place. So there's a limit also to 
this uh, quality of cities. And plants also, although we think that plants are, or we, we complain about plants being too rigid, they also have adaptive qualities. Namely because, first of all, well, they tend to, 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 to open different scenarios when they are made, but also because they are interpreted and they are applied by people. And people and organisms and networks, they change through time. And although if a plan is, on, is being applied for many years, it can change very much the way it is interpreted as any law. And, and that can also happen in this, in this context. Um, and um, and when we when we move to adaptive properties of citizens' movements, then there we find that, well, we know that there are self-organization processes that might from which might emerge new structures among peers, but also uh, between different organizations we used i used with my colleague elena in a paper we wrote we used the concept not of complex adaptive systems but of ad complex adaptive hierarchical systems in which within this system uh, elements lose their traditional hierarchy or related with power relations and hierarchy is more given by the stability of each element of the system so here planning institutions are on the top of the hierarchy not so much because they have power but because they are stable more stable and citizens movements are not uh, on the bottom of the hierarchy because they have less power but because they are more dynamic they can move more into different uh, directions so this can feed temporary or lead to temporary or, or to, to permanent uh, change. Yeah, and we experienced that by dealing with informal settlements in Portugal. Uh, we looked for some self-organization processes. This is uh, some scheme about, the, and it's also another way of uh, going into steps of self-organization uh, in, in another context. We start by a, 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 a ground zero in which, uh, well, is the, the original status of the land. Then the formation, which we call, well, the forming phase. Then we have the tipping point. From, them, from that tipping point on, uh, the, the, here they start to form as, um, sorry, I cannot. Okay, forming the first one, storming the second one. Here, storming is when they start to open up and when they start to uh, produce the, their rules. Finally, the norming. And norming here relates to the emergence of a new structure. And finally, performing. What does it mean, this performance? This performance means when these individuals uh, or these residents associations start to interact with institutions and this brings us to the second scheme which uh, explains two levels of self-organization one in which it's among peers it's the the the, the, the informal settlements self-organizing among them and the other level is after they self-organized among them they started to perform, which mean, which meant in this case, they started to self-organize with the planning institutions, and from these unexpected new structures emerged. In this case, so we know the, some of these qualities from these specific uh, contexts, um, and this was very important for lawmaking, which is a very high level of formality that started in a very informal way. And more than that, the interesting thing is that these formalizing processes then ended up contaminating other lawmaking processes. So this, there's even here a, a metastasis effect in this, in this process. So in, in now exploring, and I'm going to give you some, to, to, to guide you through some uh, properties of tactical urbanism initiatives uh, we know that they are, and they are important to, to discuss this because we know they are very, they are highly spontaneous processes in most of the cases. 
based on small scale intervention. This is very much what we've been talking here about placemaking. And they are expected to have immediate and short term effects. They are bottom up and they are, and this is something that has been also very interesting for me to, to discuss along these uh, researches. The planners have a very discrete role on the process in these cases. So, and there are many, and my, most, you, of I'm, I'm sure you know some of these or many of these uh, uh, examples. Um, uh, Batesker referred this morning to Gorilla Garden, which is one that is here, but what I was looking for, it was mainly four qualities that I could associate, that I could identify in these processes and see then at the end how they can help us to um, to make connections with, with the planning processes and with the planning institutions. So some of the characteristics that I found uh, had to do with the specialization of these groups. They are not interested of making a better neighborhood. They have just a simple task in which they are uh, specialized. They don't do anything else in their community activity unless then depave to remove uh, uh, unused asphalt to promote the regain of permeable soil in the city. Nothing else. So they specialize on something. They don't do anything else but specialize on that. Following up, that's something that from knowing one uh, initiative and knowing other initiative, we can see that sometimes there are initiatives like open streets, like play streets that today are very common in any city, started by being localized in one city. In 1914, New York made the first play streets event. And then later on, a few decades later, the other cities followed um, calling open streets or giving them other uh, names. Adding. Pavement to Plaza is one of these uh, actions in which some part of uh, also spared public space, asphalted public space is used for a micro gardening. Well, and this was used in some cities in, in, in the United States. But then later, some, move, some groups in other cities picked up the idea and, look, and moved from ad adding more qualities to the process. So you have the same initiative, but adding more qualities to it. Settling, site privatization, <laughs> to know that something is going to happen in one part of the city, and before it happens, to involve the citizens in uh, simulating what is supposed or what is supposed to, to happen there. Claiming, to use this kind of placemaking initiatives to claim for, for well, needs that the city has, like bike parking or like the use of setbacks, in which is something very common in American cities. Monitoring, to redesign intersections without the permission of authorities, that the first reaction was to refuse this kind of intervention that later on come to the process or say we're going to join and let's monitor the, the change of this uh, place together. And, f and to end up with a question, when we see these, uh, um, these characteristics of these processes, one question emerges, will they ever merge? Will there be uh, the, the, the creation of a critical mass on these kind of processes? Will ever the depaved group start to think of doing guerrilla garden together, not just depaving, but also promoting gardens. This would be like a major step. It looks like very little, but it would be a major step in, in, in this kind of processes. So there are, uh, to, to discuss a little bit, the, the, the context in which these, these um, these kind of events occur. There are obviously several opportunities from, they are opportunistic by nature, and that is something opportunistic in the sense that they spot the empty spaces, the abandoned spaces in order to intervene. 
So in this case, they have a, they play a role in the city in terms of spotting these these areas. Uh, they have the ability of come up with and monitor and and uh, help authorities and help planning institutions to test solutions in the midterm before they take into a decision. Um, there's also the possibility of, the, of involving. They are local. They are very local. They are very local. And th this brought me to, to think, and uh, I, I was in school of architecture when small is beautiful was the motto. And the motto of, this, uh, of the modernist movement. And the motto of this tactical urbanism initiative seems to be local is beautiful. It has to be local to work and to be supported by this. And uh, there are two examples of that. One of them is the pop-up cafes in which there's, it's the only of all these examples that, that I brought in which you have like specialized people working, designers working in the changing of the design of the cafe, but they were residents. It was not so much because they were designers, it was because they were part of the community that they were, they were used. So this local is beautiful, seems to be like a motto of these initiatives. And for instance, uh, one of the initiatives that is called micro mixing, it's about mixed use and everybody knows what mixed use is, but for technical urbanism, it's not just about being mixed use, it is about micro mixing. So, um, of course, this can have a, this. This has a big potential in terms of changing the the urban form of the city, in the sense that urban form, according to some uh, authors, is also related. Like Seki, it's it's also related with um, it's also related with the use that we give to the space. In that sense, this can have dramatic change in urban form. Although in terms of physical form, nothing much seems to be happening when we look to a city map. Of course, there's a contrast in here because, on the other hand, on one hand, we have the bottom up initiatives, and then we have the urban fabric that would never be built just based on bottom up initiatives. There's this balance between one, on the other, that one and the other that we have to, to take into consideration. Of course, experimentation, which was already here. Um, um, uh, pointed today is vital to this kind of uh, processes and this might change our perception of cities we move from uh, which I hope that we don't do anymore if we look to cities as an object in which it's just a matter of using the city and the city is a static element that doesn't change and it's there to be used to what is still very common to use as a city as a, the result of a plan in which we have a starting point and an ending point and we expect to reach that point eventually through all the planning measures that uh, we prescribe and that here we are talking about transforming the city and what we can learn from tactical urbanism combined with looking at the city as a complex system is to transform the, the city by using it. It's the the experience of using the city that contributes most for, which means that the city can be this and this and that, but we don't know what is going to be, but I in each moment the city is changing because it's being used on a different m way and this puts the focus not so much on the object, the city, not so much of the concept or, or the vision that we have for the city, but on the process of planning and of transforming the city. T today we were talking about, during the workshop, about some, uh, some qualities came uh, connected with the processes, with the experiences that, that, that we had. And, uh, well, from all this revision and all this uh, research, then I would say that it's not so much about trying to find or to look for a recipe, a solution, but much more to extract the qualities of each one of these processes and in these experiences and this successful experience now in a broader uh, context not just of technical urbanism but uh, on, on the other uh, examples but including the other examples that we've been uh, working in we find three key elements to these processes to evolve and to be successful 
experimentation on one hand, experiment, exp fail and try, fail and try, fail and try. Long term relations, trust built between di d different actors, etc., and short chains. With especially when we are talking about very bottom up and top down procedures, short chains between municipalities and citizens can be vital in order to make the change to occur. And finally, this is the last slide, revisiting some planning theory because that's the, in the personal perspective, the ultimate fun of it is to be able at the end to look at all the other, all the, the concepts and the, I'm sorry this is too small. But in, in terms of normative, we are always discussing dichotomies in general. Our, our discussions is very much about being rigid or being flexible. And what we learn from this process is that the fact that they are experimental and they are long term and they are, um, and, um, and, and, and they are uh, connected in this very short chain uh, uh, way allows processes to be rigid where they have to be rigid and flexible with where they have to be flexible and we addressed also this today when we or yesterday when we talked about taking care of the details fair, paying very much attention to the details and that you can only do combining these three things experimentation to try different things and uh, after that try to extract lessons from that Short chains are vital because you don't lose information between the bottom and the up. But for that, you also need long-term relations because that is the one that allows trust and allows the trust on it, particularly in these short, uh, uh, short connections, short chains. Hierarchy. I think we are too much influenced for having, from the beginning, a very top-down planning system. So the moment we start to question top-down planning system, we said, no, it has to be bottom-up. Uh, what, we, what we learn from these processes is that in most of the cases, if you look at it from a complexity perspective, we see that they are, at once, they are at the same time, bottom-up and top-down. You have to have the two working in order to promote uh, and to uh, get um, a more effective result from, this, uh, fr from the process. And then... And this is, uh, I, I think, a real task. This m really uh, uh, challenges us to rethink the role of the planner. Is that, unfortunately, it seems that these successful stories on which co-evolution, self-organization was present, planners were strangely absent of it. Maybe because these are peripheral processes that planners are not so much interested. In the case of Lisbon, while these processes were taking uh, uh, were, were were taking place, and these all this self-organization and complex well and co-evolution uh, processes were, were taking place, and planners were very much absent. Where were planners? Where were architects? Well, Expo ninety eight was happening in Lisbon, so they they were very much occupied doing very fancy plans for the for the seafront of the city. So who cares about informal settlements? Um, so, but this absence, sometimes it was a fortune because when we see the result of the, of the land, of, of the lawmaking process, it was much more effective and much faster lawmaking process than in other cases. We analyzed the Informal Settlements Act and compared with the Planning Act and we saw how long it took to have a planning act, a new planning act in Portugal, and this was made in a few months. Um, so, to question all these dichotomies, make us think maybe we are putting the wrong questions, or our questions are a little bit aside of what is the actual problem. Because if short chains are so important so for these successful processes, why are we discussing so much? down, bottom up, maybe it's about brokerage, it's about who is in the middle and can be the broker that can make the process move and not be get stuck in the different levels of bottom up and top down that sometimes exist. How can long-term relations 
that are vital for this process to occur and to trust to be built be compatible with short term in well namely political agendas which tend which tend to be short term uh, and um, how to combine these initiatives that are very much bottom up like technical urbanism with the uh, well, well with the top down initiatives with the planning so i think uh, what we see, this is a novelty, and I'm finished. This is I finished. I can put here the thank you, but just I would like to say a last phrase. We we tend to put these uh, processes at the end of the line. We do the plan, we have the implementation process, and then eventually there will come up some citizens trying to do something, and we try to put it either including or putting a little bit apart or ignoring them. So I think it's really it can be really interesting maybe to start to try to start by here to really see when you start to revise a plan or to see what's on what's what's happening what's happening what are the initiatives and then include that in the, constru the construction or in the revision of the of, of of the plan not putting it at the end of the line but at the beginning of the line and then it can be really to reflect and to reshape the entire planning process thank you Consistently, so again, you don't get a you get you know it's it's like you don't get a difference between places. You get some. In some cases in Israel, we found some cases where p places felt very good in winter and very bad in summer, and vice versa. So that happens, and, but but not all. It's some places, uh, and obviously, it also very much depends on how people are feeling at the moment. But as I said. When you aggregate the maps together, uh, you are um, you getting rid a lot of the noise of the individual aspects because they cancel each other out, and you're getting the patterns of that is more related to those. So, uh, so as I said, uh, I'm I'm sure that if you if you for instance did it on a regular basis, um, through like three four times a year, and connect when the observations were made with the temperature. And the, and the insulation and the climatic conditions, you will be able to get, get a very rich data, that data from which you can make a lot of the interesting, uh, interesting inferences. But that work is still to be done by someone, probably not me. So anybody looking here for master's thesis? <laughs> <laughs> Plenty of work. I have two comments. One, one to Dan, the, the feeling maps actually and the lack of feeling maps are doing that kind of analysis in public space to me is very similar to the lack of post-occupancy evaluation that's done on housing projects. And I think, I, I know that there are apps now that are being used to do the feeling map where we can get a better analysis of data, both 
who the person is who's feeding into the app on how I feel at this place, and also what time of day I was there and what time of year. Yeah. So I think that that's the, the way to go for the efficiency. But there's a bunch of people over at Hebrew Room Geography who are working on that, mostly led by Mark Shufat. I think they're even doing it with blood pressure bands around tourists in different places. And that's the one I don't know that's you guys are not. They're checking how tourists feel yeah. in different places in Jerusalem. It's really interesting stuff. Um, hello. <laughs> I think that it's really interesting that you gave this lecture here in Jerusalem. Um, because I think that maybe we have one of the answers here to this bottom-up and top-down thing. I think that what we have here in the person of these community planners, like Ruth and Yonatan and Sivan, and, and to a degree also what we've been seeing from the makers that you've, that you've supported, is the middle. The Hira and Ella and Ravid, it's the middle out working as the broker with the city, under the radar where it needs to be, in time over, connected to the community, and understanding that their goal is to merge. What you asked as a question, I think to them is fairly clear that that's their goal, that you take the people who are active in doing the community garden with Ariela and Iran, and you work with them on the next stage of it. And then the next stage comes. And they become troublemakers when they move from doing the community garden to protesting the roots of the light rail. But it's those same people all over the city that we see time and time again. And part of the greatness of the tactical urbanism stuff is it's so quick, it's so easy, that it draws them in on the first level without, when they're also young, we talk also about the younger people and the older people, without waiting for the long-term processes. So you asked a lot of questions. And I want to encourage you guys, apropos our earlier conversation, I think you're, you're really the answer. And I think it's a really unique answer. And I think it's something that needs an incredible amount of support and development. And it needs to happen elsewhere than in Jerusalem. So thanks, sir. But that's, that's my comment on, on that piece. Yeah, yeah I think it's, uh, yeah, it's not just to do that, but to be aware that you are doing that. That's right. That you have a, a that you play a key role in the process. Yep. Yeah. Um, I have a provocative and annoying question to open as a reason. And I want to make clear first that I do not support the attitude of the designs. It's just that I think while I can start answering my question, you can give me much more eloquent answers to this one putting it to you. Uh, and this is in, in all three presentations, the bottom line was something that very much repeats itself since the 60s, from Davidoff, very much from John Freeman and Sergio Berry, from community planning, that is a, the, the stance of planning theory, that planners should move away from technocracy and find more users, values, users, knowledge. And why do we need complexity theory for this? What is the, what is the unique contribution to complexity theory in order to present this particular stance, attitude, in uh, planning? Mm -hmm. Can I answer? <laughs> <laughs> sure. My direct answer is, is that although the ideas behind communicative planning are very, um, uh, how do you say, uh, I can be very supportive of them, they're very, uh, um, you know, agreeable, likable. I think the way in which c uh, communicative planning has actually worked into planning is based on consensus seeking. She didn't mean communicative, you meant community planning, right? Yes. Um, it's focused on building consensus. And consensus is about finding the optimal solution that is either, well, you mentioned also the technical rationale, that's finding the best technical solution, whereas communicative planning is based on, is focused on finding the most agreed upon solution. And I think both trends in planning theory are very much focused on finding the solution. And what complexity theory teaches us is that um, maybe there is not one solution, but maybe there are many solutions, or maybe there are solutions that we cannot completely oversee yet, that we can reach through experimentation and by doing. And I think the, the biggest benefit from complexity theory is that it takes us away from any broad narratives 
I draw narratives that explain the world, that explain contradictions, that explain you know, the idea about finding the solution and this is the answer. Complexity makes us very much aware of the, the local, the dynamics, the small scale, the micro, and makes us much more sensitive to, um, well, to the situation in which we find ourselves and makes us much more modest. So I, that, that would be my answer. After all, we're all just mushrooms. Yes, <laughs> well, you know, there is not one answer. And I think, once again, I very much support the ideas that were behind community planning, but the way it actually operationalized planning practice is slightly different. Can, can I add my uh, answer? I mean, it's a very, very good question. And, and I also ask myself, like when I heard Paolo and, and Dudan about how can we integrate this idea into a procedure because one very good thing about modern planning was it was very clear how to how to act I mean but you know you, you do a survey you put uh, uh, alternatives you choose one you it's a simple way to, to go forward and you have a plan when you have a plan it's clearly what everybody has to has to do but it's not just a procedure, it's a great idea behind it. It's the idea of kubernetes, of, uh, of, mechan of mechanism of, of uh, operation, that we can, in a way, uh, make a scientific analysis of the this environment and plan it according to the scientific analysis. But if we shift from this understanding and this uh, agreement into a vision that accepts the basics of uh, complexity, as, as Sefan put, it, put them uh, in our lecture, then we need a different way to, to operate. And it cannot be a very clear solution, a very clear, clear procedure. It has to be fractals, and maybe we will be able to merge it into a more clear uh, idea. But then again, if we didn't have the theory behind it, what are we doing here? Also talking about return to realism on the complex realism. I'm sorry, I. Well, in my in my case, that made me look at this from the complexity perspective, mm -hmm. namely when it comes to the informal informality in terms of settlements. Is that okay? If I looked at it in a, in a simple perspective, I have a process <coughs> of making that lasted for six months. That was it. The law was submitted to the parliament six months later, was approved and implemented, and it was a good, a successful case. But to learn where this success came from, I didn't look into six months, but I looked into 40 years. Because, yeah, if you have, if you want to look at the complex, in the, comp in the complex perspective, to processes, sometimes you have to know much further and, and, and that's what when you start to look and then you find the patterns that you cannot see if you look just for six months or one year then it says okay this might be self-organization process that is behind it here or it might be an evolutionary process in this so it helped me in that sense of making me look looking to, to the same things from a completely different perspective, not in theoretical, only in theoretical terms, but also in terms of the time span. And good for patterns imply that we need to go from one suspected times. If I may add, <coughs> uh, I think, uh, first of all, I, I don't think communica communicative planning nor comprehensive planning uh, uh, don't have something to contribute. Uh, there are definitely occasions when you need a comprehensive plan, found, especially when you have foundational s situations, or when you are sometimes when you have uh, after uh, after catastrophes, you need a very clear, top-down, simplistic plan to to get things life back to some track. So, and, and, uh, as long as you know that that doesn't exhaust the situation, and the same thing in, in some. Occasions, communicative plan planning is actually uh, extremely important because as a way of mediating between different communities, uh, in particular situations where, where there are shared spaces, where you identify uh, conflicts. But I think uh, what complexity adds is that it, it allows allows for many uncoordinated 
and sometimes conflictual events and, and opportunities to, uh, and planning, planners. Everybody is a planner. That's, that's you know, one of the ideas of uh, Portugal. That is, there's a lot of planning happening. Everybody is planning, and it's all important. It all, it all has its place. And, it, it, and there's no need for you communicate communication. You just do. And, uh, and when you hit some walls, then you, you, then you need to negotiate. But sometimes you don't have to negotiate. So in a sense, it's just an expansion of the, of the understanding of, of planning and not uh, a, a supplantation of one idea by another. Uh, yeah, I wanted to, to address something, a different topic. So if you yeah, want to respond on this discussion, and go ahead. Yeah, to end it another day. Okay. Okay. Oh, I wanted to make a remark because I was very uh, enthusiastic about the two presentations, actually, because you both used uh, uh, medical metaphors in a presentation. <laughs> and I was thinking that if we were talking about diagnosis tools, and actually the feeling maps and tactical urbanism are two very good um, diagnosis instruments in um, either identifying the problem or finding possible ways to uh, or to experiment in order to find new ways of urban development or um, mm. and I think you both talked about it's not about just you know giving it a side but uh, well that, that was actually your remark it's about giving it a side but um, uh, the methods. yes and I thought the, the combination of feeling that with ur technical urbanism could be a very, uh, um, well, you could actually fill a repertoire of methods in order to, to, to work on this kind of way. So that's just a remark that I was to make. Yeah, I think also the, and a possible, um, possible complementarity between, uh, between technical urbanism and planning is that sometimes we are both our planning is very much focused on problems mm -hmm. rather than in solutions. So in the technical analysis, is not so much into analysis or making big uh, even diagnoses, but it's to come up with a solution. So it's uh, and to combine both. I think yeah. it would be a very good, a very interesting uh, combination. In fact. Uh, Budgeting, there's a risk that I identified. It's it, instead of being bottom up, which is the case of Lisbon, middle class, etc. It's in, instead of being bottom up actions, it's, I called it instead of bottom up, middle going everywhere, which means the middle class putting pressure on the institutions on one hand, but in taking the, uh, the place of the lower classes. And that's true for tactical urbanism as well, I mean, yeah. even more. And because also tactical. Well, so I was giving, adding this example, tactical urbanism is also very much about a well-educated yeah. fringe of society that has this empowerment and this ability of doing things. And the fact, the fact that they are doing those things in that space might even take space to other people with more needs to do other things and to have like inclusive solutions. But nevertheless, it's a testing. It's something that can be a trigger to make others trying to do things and trying to motivate. But there's this risk, in fact, identified in, the, in relation to the participatory budget. I'm not sure it's against the middle class, but, but whoever holds power. Yeah. Even in the, the lower classes. You said that in your lecture that there is the danger that the municipality or the authorities are using 
is civil participation in order to control. Yeah. And it happens a lot in Jerusalem that mm -hmm. you take citizens and you help them participate in the process, but the main reason is to eliminate the objections in the future. Mm -hmm people the, the impression they have power to decide and then you but I'm, I cannot relate to directly to the Israeli example but in Portugal this is a fact yeah. you, 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 you pretend you're giving power and it's a, a way to concentrate power because you release this energy of people who want to participate <coughs> by these movements mm -hmm. a colleague of mine last week was giving a very nice example of these Nike shoes in which they give people the opportunity of painting the the Nike shoes wherever they want, so they get all these people think they are creating, they give all these new ideas, they don't have to spend ma money on uh, uh, commercials or anything because people are doing the work for free. And then they can use it or not, they can see how the market reacts. And the music model is doing that. They are choosing by voting solutions for each neighborhood, each parish, but then they keep the rest of the ideas that were not voted they keep, they have a, a box down there in some office with all the ideas, they can pop up if it's convenient or not. So I just it. wanted to say that, don't mistake, uh, I mean, every set that, that you have in these uh, techniques exists in, in a business as usual as well. It's not nothing new, I mean, it just, some of them are unavoidable, some of them are avoidable with a little bit more experience and wisdom, but nothing new. I mean, no threats are emerging from these tactics that, that do not exist at this point. Yeah, I, I, can I, I, I really like to say something. Uh, it, 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 there seems as though, especially in the, acad in, in the academic community, in the, in the critical academic community, there is like almost a, a, a reflex. Whenever something new comes up and is enthusiastically taken up by people because they feel that it does something for them and and, uh, and it even manages to be taken up by people with power so then immediately it becomes suspect and immediately it becomes uh, criticized and it's usually criticized because it's not inclusive enough because it's not it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, take into account the, the, the most poor, the most emergent, etc., etc., et and, and and so the, the way it leaves me feeling is okay. Yeah, it may be true. All may be true. But what is your alternative? Should, uh, should we remain where we were before? Should we go back to where we were before? And and I think um, this is uh, there is no way around power relations in society. Uh, they have been with us since the dawn of mankind and even before, and, uh, and they will probably remain with us, and it's really up to individuals when they're doing the work to make sure that they're not, uh, they're minimizing uh, impact yeah. and are inclusive as, as everyone. I think this is, this is really up to us as planners often to, to be there in the process and to make sure that the community is actually aware of the, of those people that are not in the, in, in the discussion. That's really, if, if we have a, a place in the room, that's our place yeah. in the room. And mm -hmm. this is also the one short remark I wanted to make, that, that, that through this both uh, uh, lectures, at a certain point we spoke about opportunity of response from institutions, and you said ignore, treat differently, integrate, and actually all the three of them are a way to integration. They are all no integration. No, but they are all eventually landing into integration into the system. So maybe one of the places where to focus attention, planning work for planners, that I don't know too much about it, but it's exactly what is the mechanism of integration that is being applied. And to influence also at this level, what is the kind of mechanism of integration that keeps it?